Well, this passage of Scripture, so beautifully just read by Mary, may seem not such a good place in the Bible for us to land on Mother's Day of all days. In fact, you may be thinking, well, preacher, that scripture's sort of inappropriate for a Sunday when we're celebrating motherhood and apple pie and the perfection of women. After all, the classic scripture text often used by preachers on this day is Proverbs chapter 31. Go home and read it. It's about the virtuous woman. Her husband without ceasing sings her praises. Her children dressed in spotless starch clothes hang on her every word. Blah, blah, blah. <laughs> it's basically a reflection of that song which says, she brings home the bacon, fries it up in the pan, and never, ever let you forget you're her man, <laughs> if you know what I mean. <laughs> the perfect woman, wife, mother, girlfriend. I know you're out there somewhere. Some of you may come close. Mine certainly does. Oh. Very close. <laughs> <laughs> Now, I'm not a woman, never have been, and I don't know what it's like to be one. But I've wondered, women, if that scripture, Proverbs 31, doesn't depress you just a little bit. I mean, who can really live up to all of that? The female we meet in today's scripture seems a far reach from that idea. We don't know her name. I'm sad about that. She's not even given the respect to be called by her name. She is known to us through the description of the storyteller as simply a slave girl. It's a label, not a name. There's a difference, you know. I got thinking about that. How many people do we know in this world by labels instead of their names? One of the things we struggle with right here at South Main Chapel, being a new church and all, and being a purposefully diverse church coming from different parts of our community, one of the things we struggle with is learning one another's names, don't we? I want to report to you, we have some folks working on a family gallery of pictures that will hang down the hallway proudly. And when asked, I hope you will consent to have your picture taken and placed there upon it with your name. But we do not know her name. We know her label, slave girl. We do that to one another. We diminish one another with labels, the blacks, the Hispanics, the gays, the rednecks, the liberals, the right-wingers, the illegal aliens, and on and on, all ways of describing folks without using their names. There's a difference between a label and a name. Who are we? I ask you that question every Sunday, don't, don't I? Who are we? Children of God. I think that's the only label really worth anything. I wonder if before making pronouncements about some of the most divisive political, cultural, and religious issues, if we would stop to ask the name of someone on the other side of that issue and then consider our viewpoint and what we're saying as how that might affect them. I wonder if we might think twice before saying things we say. 
She is simply called the slave girl. Can we give her a name? Can we? Put the name of a woman who is special in your life as her name. On this Mother's Day, I think about women very special to me. My mother, her name is Patty. Or my wife, her name is Jean. Or my granddaughter, her name is Olivia. What if the slave girl's name is Patty? Or Jean? Or Olivia? Does it change the story? I think she needs a name. Let me warn you about something, though. There is danger in learning someone's name to the point of opening your heart to really know them. When that happens, we can no longer just pass them by or cast them aside or ignore their hurts or stop our ears to their cries or turn a blind eye to their needs or see them as less than human. When we know their name, we can no longer let what they do or where they have been be a, become a wall around our hearts. I think she needs a name. What about you? I will call her Grace, this slave girl. I would like to have known more about Grace's story. How old is she? Who in her life cares about her? She has to be somebody's daughter and granddaughter, maybe someone's sister. Is she herself yet a mother? The description of her actions and the definition of her situation tell us that Grace is a vulnerable woman in a world that is exploiting her vulnerabilities. Grace is being used. Do you know any women who are being used? That's the definition of exploitation. To use selfishly for one's own ends. According to the story, Grace is a fortune teller. She does a carnival act that is perceived by some as scintillating and entertaining. There is a dark side to what she does, but it is how she earns a living. It is how she's surviving in her world. Someone has convinced her that she has no other choice. And maybe in a world where women were horrifically oppressed and slavery was not only tolerated but embraced as an economic necessity, maybe she did have no other choice. Her condition, her disability, her vulnerability, whatever it was, resulted in a lack of self-control, in a shortage of self-respect. Grace had no filters. She blurted out and spewed out whatever came into her mind, and so she was seen as a menace to many, including Paul and his sidekick Silas. They have come into Macedonia to carry out their work of sharing the good news of Jesus and Grace, she starts following them around and shouting at them as they go. One commentator describes it this way. He said this fortune teller finds herself drawn to the Apostle Paul and his sidekick Silas and she names who they are and what they are doing. They are servants of the Most High God who are telling you the way to be saved. Apparently, she was like a broken record, following them and shouting her message like a carny on the midway. Although Paul surely was impressed by her persistence and intrigued by her mystical insight, he was getting much annoyed at her. And in frustration, Paul turns around and performs an exorcism right then and there. Whereupon the owners 
of Fortunes Are Us <laughs> drag Paul and Silas into the marketplace to face the authority. In the name of Jesus, Paul heals grace of her affliction. Now this story does not tell us exactly how he did it, but Paul brings grace to Jesus and she is set free. But this act of liberation is not greeted warmly by those who are making money and lots of it off of grace and her affliction. Her freedom meant the end of their gravy train. <laughs> It would seem, whoever these profiteers of abuse were, they had connections and they had power. For they arranged for Paul and Silas to be arrested and placed in a prison cell. It is at this point in the story we lose sight of Grace, the slave girl. We do not know what happens to her when she's no longer under the control of the demon or demons who kept her trapped. We do not know if now that her freedom has been won and her exploitation has ended, does she go on to a better life? We are not given the outcome of the invention. I have learned that is often the way it goes. We do not always know on this side of eternity how something we did or a word we said or an action we took may have been the seed which sprouts later into a life changed or hope restored. What we do know from the story is that a power that is abused rarely volunteer, voluntarily acquiesces to justice. Power rarely surrenders on its own to the common good or the angels of a better nature. Power has to be compelled or persuaded or challenged. In the case of Grace, the slave girl, those who held power over her were incensed at what Paul did, in reality what Jesus did, to free Grace from, capti from captivity. These men who were pimping her out for their profit would not have on their own come to the conclusion that for them to use her for their own financial gain was not only unjust, it was inhumane. And only when their power was confronted by God's power did things begin to change. Amen. I told you in a sermon a few weeks ago that I believe God has moved into this neighborhood. Amen. Right? Amen. And where God lives, evil is challenged. Where God lives, injustice is confronted. And where God lives, the powers of this world are compelled to surrender. Yeah. Hallelujah. Now how God's power overcomes this world is somewhat unpredictable. Rarely, if ever, does God come into the room with guns drawn <laughs> or barreling into the battlefield with tanks armed. That just does not seem to be the way the God we call Jesus operates. The next scene of today's scripture story moves us from the slave girl to Paul and Silas in the Roman prison cell. What are they doing while locked up behind bars? What do you do while locked up behind bars? How are they passing the time? What would, what would you be doing if you were thrown in jail for a reason so unjust? Well, I'd be demanding to see my lawyer. I'd be crying out for anyone to help me. I'd be complaining about the food and the hard bed and the lack of private facilities, believe me. <laughs> but no, no, Paul and Silas, what are they doing? They're singing, singing and praying and acting like it's church there in the prison. And the next thing they know, something happens. Something happens unpredictable and shocking to all who were watching, for the walls of that prison began to tremble, and the floor below them begins to shake, and the bars of those prison cells creak, and they rattle, and they bend until they're literally open. And the poor Roman soldier given charge over them to guard Paul and Silas does not begin to know what to do. And so Paul, but Paul himself and Silas know exactly 
what has happened. God has moved into the neighborhood. Amen. The power of God has been swept over that prison and the chains and the shackles and the bars of injustice have been loosened and the goodness and the justice and the mercy of God has arrived and the exploitation of them has been reversed. The prisons are prisoners are no longer prisoners and the captors are no longer captors. <clears throat> That's what happens when God moves into the neighborhood. Yeah. My friends, God has moved into this neighborhood. Yeah. And let me tell you something. He's not moving out. Yeah. <laughs> News flash, folks. He's not going anywhere. Yeah. Staying right here. And under God's power and control, we're going to keep on here. We're going to keep on singing and praying and breaking bread and sharing the good news until the bars and the chains and the shackles binding the lives of the broken are one by one set loose. about the property across the side street from us. The old Sterling printing property. We're going to claim that property for the good works of God's kingdom somehow, Amen. some way. And that corner right out there, the corner of June Avenue and South Main Street, that is going to be a corner where women and men will no longer stand there because the injustice of a world filled with drug dealers and pimps has enslaved them to a prison of degradation on that corner. No, that's not going to be what that corner is about. That corner is going to be a turning point to a new life and a different direction. A place to start over. In the name of Jesus, that is going to happen. Now, the owner of that property doesn't know that yet. <laughs> and he's going to know. He's going to know. And as the great Handel wrote, and many of us have sung, the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our Lord. Yes. And of his Christ. Amen. Yes. And we shall, and he shall reign yes. forever yes. and ever. Praise God. Can you see that vision? Yes. Can you hear that call? Yes. Can you claim that hope? Yes. Exploitation yes. will be reversed. The prisoners will be prisoners no more. Yes. And the captors will be captors no more. And all will be named children of the living God. If you are here today, and I guess you are, right? <laughs> and I don't know your name, I want to know your name. If you're here today, and you are, I want you to know one another's name. No one should leave here today feeling as if you are a laborer. You have a name. You are precious in his sight and our sight. The invitation today is for all of us to go a little deeper and a little further and take a few more risks. Someone is calling your name. As we'll sing in just a second. It may not be a shout or a scream. It may be a whisper, softly and tenderly, calling your name. Come on. Come on. If you're weary, come on home. Where is home? Where is 